Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Melanie Yazzie. I'm a professor of art practices at CU Boulder and head of printmaking there. Um, and I will begin. Um, I love the salt water plant and mourn for the bitter water plant. My maternal grandfather's plant is Edgewater. My paternal grandfather's plant is red straight into the water. And this is who I am. I am a Diné woman um, of the what most people call the Navajo Nation, but we call ourselves Diné. If you guys want to look, look, come up here, because it'll be hard to see from the side, just bring your chairs over here. Um, so this is me at um, a super young age. My parents sent me to a Montessori school on the Navajo Reservation, and this is actually one of my first pieces at three years old. Um, and as you see some of my work, you'll see that I can, I'm still in that same vein. <laughs> um, in my early years, I did a series of prints where I was printing on wrapping paper. And I chose wrapping paper because um, I guess the American public or larger public wants to wrap Native Americans in this stereotypical images to like sort of package us and gift wrap us in these images. So I thought what perfect surface to work on would be wrapping paper. Um, so there's a series of these that are speaking about stereotypes, looking at the land. Um, this piece is called Indian Lookalikes. Um, I, I usually get invited to do talks during November at different schools because that's when everyone's celebrating Thanksgiving. And I went to school to speak about like stereotypes and Native people. And um, at the school, the teacher then, immediately after my talk, gave this handout to the students, which says, Indian lookalikes. We be circled the Indians that look the same and color them. And I was just like, ooh. <laughs> So I took the thing and I blew it up in a screen print and then inserted my image um, in there of me in grade school, that I'm not wearing headdress and feathers as a Native person. And to just like question that whole way of, of which people were identifying me. Um, I've also done a series of pieces where I've been printing on bluebird flower sacks. Bluebird flower sacks in my community, we use it for um, ceremonies when we get together, we use the flour to make fry bread to feed people. And when I was growing up, we would sew the sacks together to either make curtains for home. So I made this quilt image, and on the surface, I printed my certificate of Indian blood. There is a, a law called the 1990 Indian Arts and Crafts Law that says that you have to prove that you're a certain percentage Native American to claim that ancestry and you have to prove it when you exhibit out in the world. Um, it's really meant for uh, people who are in the craft because a lot of our jewelry making, um, our crafts have been taken into other countries and made and it doesn't come back to our people who do it traditionally. So they made this 1990 Indian, 1990 Indian Arts and Crafts Law to protect us, but in the contemporary arts, what it did was it became this way of excluding different people from different backgrounds. And if you research your own history, in our history, there's been a lot of mixed marriage that, that's happened. There are people in our communities that don't want to be registered as Native, and so it brings up a lot of different uh, arguments. And so this quilt was um, showing three different types of Certificate of Indian Blood, and it, there's this huge story that goes with it. But I'm always thinking about the materials I'm working with, why I'm working with the materials, and this is a, a good example of that. Um, I've done a lot of works on the bluebird flower sacks. This was uh, one of my favorite foods growing up was Navajo blood sausage, and uh, it was for a project where everybody was making the recipe of their favorite food, so this was my favorite recipe growing up. Um, and I, I went on to do this project for a group exhibition where we were all, uh, everyone was given about four or five feet of space in like a 14 feet high wall. So I framed the works, um, the pieces of my grandmother's skirts, and then I had printed images of Navajo women on 
newsprint that I pinned onto my grandmother's skirts. Um, we're a matrilineal society, so everything is passed through the women, and the women are the ones who decide what's happened. So I wanted to make that um, statement with this piece. And then again, thinking about my grandmother and using her skirts for the piece was really important to me. I, I ventured into doing a series of paintings that were self-portraits, and a lot of the paintings had the image of um, a spinal cord through, like, spinal image in the, in the center to represent strength. And uh, it was in the early 90s, I was coming back from my studio late at night, and I was hit head-on by a drunk driver, and it really messed with my back. And so a lot of the pieces that I make are um, self-portraits about just healing myself from with, within the artwork that I'm making. Um, this is one of those pieces. This is another piece. My, my, the women on my dad's side of the family have a history of getting cancer of the uterus, and, um, and I had a scare with that in the mid-90s. Um, I made a lot of work about it. I was teaching a class in France, and before I left, I had, I think I was probably 37, I went to the doctor and said, I think I'm going through menopause, and the doctor said, no, you're too young, that's not possible, and I said, no, I think, think it's happening. Um, they did some tests, and before I left for France, they said, you know, that's, you are, and we don't see this, and I said, I I feel like there's something else happening. And he said, no, everything else is okay. So I went to France. While I was in France, I got all these phone calls from the doctor's office. And then I finally was able to reach them. And I said, I've got all these messages. What's happening? And they said, well, we did the test. And you could have cancer of the uterus. We need you to come in immediately. We need to you know, put a camera inside you to look for things. and." Uh, we're, we're really sorry. And I said, I have three more weeks in France. I can't get home. I don't know what to do. And they said, just, um, well, as soon as you get back, we'll start the test. So I was stuck there in France, and I started doing these series of self-portraits. And a lot of them were about travel, about looking back inside myself, about feeling that I had no arms to help myself. and. Um, images of healing, like I put plants and things inside. I started using these circle images because I, in my mind I was thinking, when they do put the camera in me, I want it to be shiny and clean and um, nothing growing. So I you know, embarked on this whole series and um, I got back and they did the tests and the doctor said, there's nothing wrong. And I said, well, um, I, I, like, maybe you got the test mixed up with someone else, and they said, no, it was definitely you. Uh, we can't really explain it. What have you been doing? And I said, uh, I've been meditating, and I've been making artwork about myself, and just drawing and painting things, healing, and that's all I could do, because I couldn't get back. And they said, well, you need to keep doing that. So that's where a lot of the work um, comes from, is this, time of, of self-healing. Uh, this is a piece I call She Keeps Silent. Um, I, now in my life, I'm like in my 50s now, I, I can talk about anything, but in the early days of undergrad school and getting grad school, I was super, super shy. And I made this piece thinking, I'm going to make this piece that's a self-portrait of me, and that piece is going to keep my silence. Um, you can come in here and sit, sit up here so you can see. Um, so that piece will keep my silence again. After that, I'm going to be able to talk about all the issues that are happening in my community. I'm going to talk about the domestic violence, the alcoholism, the things that are present in my family. I'm not going to be ashamed of those things because I think we spend too much time in life hiding a lot of that. So this piece was really important to me because she will hold that silence. She'll be the quiet one. And then from this point forward, in my mind, I would be open to talking about all of these things that I kept hidden. And um, these are a series of lithographs that are documenting um, this part of my history that my great-grandfather used to partake in. He did this ceremony where he would 
um, heal these toys. Um, and the, in Navajo it says, the way she and on like the making of the, of the babies or the toys. Um, I grew up talking about um, and always collecting toys. And it's only been recent that I've been able to share more about it. Um, I think a lot of it I just kept hidden. But I've been getting more comfortable with, with sharing with people this part of my history. My gra great grandfather um, was this healer who, who took care of people's toys. So if, in our way, if the toy had a bad spirit or something wrong with it, and it was with a child, it could do the child harm. And so my great grandfather, people would travel from all over the reservation to him, and he would do these ceremonies on the toys and fix them. And, um, and this series of pieces now is talking about that. The, the writing on the right hand side is my own like hieroglyphs of, of speaking about prayer and ceremony that are not Navajo, but they're my way of speaking about that and putting it into the work. The butterflies uh, symbolize transformation and change and then these little dolls are there and I have my fingerprints because in most indigenous communities, um, when people were signing legal documents, they'd either sign with their fingerprint. And so I started incorporating that into some of the works that I made because of that history. Here's more of these, these pieces. I've spent some time traveling to New Zealand. And uh, in New Zealand, when you're welcome onto a meeting house, they do the haka, which is a challenge to the visitors. And so, um, the numbers in the work will either refer to counting of people, because all of us as, as indigenous people who are enrolled members of a tribal group have an enrollment number that we're given. So counting is a big part of my work. I am also um, have lived with diabetes, and so counting, keeping track of my numbers is always really important. So those, those that's another aspect of the numbers that show up in the work. And, there's always mapping in the work also to speak about land base and where I'm coming from, um, indigenous lands. Um, and I think mapping shares so much of our history. And so oftentimes when I do projects with people, I'll have them look up maps from the past and compare them to what's happening in communities presently. So there's a lot of layers to the work um, when they're making it. But that Hakka image is about challenging the viewer. Like, are you good or are you bad? How can you come into this piece and into the story? The Bureau of Indian Affairs. And then reminding myself that I have to keep telling the story about my community, about my people. It's, it's important to talk about all of these things. When I'm in the studio working, I wanted to show images of how I make my monotypes. Um, this is like getting the inks out. Um, I start by drawing out my images, making like hundreds of stencils to work with. And, and then I start rolling out the ink and inking up the front and the back of the stencils. Those of you who participated in the jelly plate workshop today, we, we did this at a tiny scale. Um, this is at a larger scale, making the monotypes I do. All along doing these types of things, I try to remind people that we're artists, but we also, when we're in these positions of teaching, we sometimes get assigned to designing a new building. So at the same time as me making my work, they're like, oh, you're hired to teach at City of Boulder in 2006, so uh, in two years you're going to start designing our new print space. <laughs> so as artists, it's not only just about making your art, but then you then have to meet with architects and different people to like construct this. So I wanted to incorporate this into the, uh, the talk to just explain like our work as artists isn't just about the art making. It's like creating a space, um, making it happen, and then part of being a research professor is that you, you can come over here to this side, so if you want to see, you can put a chair right there. Um, in between, like designing and meeting with architects, I have part of our research as tenure track people at a research school is that you have to keep showing your work, traveling. So this is me in Hawaii doing doing a project there with my friend Miley Andrade. Um, and it was funny because I met her in New Zealand in 1995 and I'd been back to New Zealand various times. I think I've been at least nine or ten times. And, 
I'd always run into Hawaiians and they'd be like, how come you're always over here and you don't come to Hawaii? And I said, well, the Maori people send a plane to get. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, we better get you one. So I ended up in Hawaii for 18 days. And there I was doing workshops with Miley and her students working with the Akua inks hand printing. Um, the Akua inks that I travel around uh, sharing with people are soy-based ink. We don't clean up with any solvents. You can use big wipes or dish soap to clean it all up. It's really friendly. So a lot of times people are like, how did you get to go to France or this place? And I'm like, well, this one I went because I'm dealing with indigenous issues in the land and mapping uh, that project. They wanted to learn about safer ways of doing printmaking. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of ways in which your research and the work that all of you are doing can take you to different places. And it's that whole thing your, your teachers will probably talk about is the networking that you do. Is you get to know different people. When an invitation comes to you, like, hey, come to my studio, like, you want to make that appointment right away. Don't let it wait. Because these opportunities come up and they, they pass. Um, so just, I'd say, do it. Um, I've spent time going to different print conferences. This is a print conference in Estonia. I put together a print exchange and um, early in my career um, I was traveling to all these different places in the world and I remember I met some people who weren't so friendly and they were like, oh it's so great that you're native and a woman you get all these opportunities and everything's so easy for you. And I thought, it's not, but how can, I mean, it's sort of true, but what can I do with how I make my work and get out in the world? You know what? I'm going to make some printing changes. I'm going to invite some people of color, some quiet people who aren't going to push and walk all over other people to get ahead. I'm going to put those in the print exchanges with really well-known artists, and I'm going to travel it to Estonia. I'm going to take it to South Africa. Africa, I'm going to take it to France, that will build all of those young artists' resumes. Because I started realizing in academia, when I was going through school, there were a lot of people who really did not want me in that space. I think when I was at uh, ASU, Arizona State University, as an undergrad, I remember I took an English class, and the professor was a Rhodes Scholar, and he said the first day, I know you're all here to take this, but I don't believe women should be at the university. And he said, so if that's you, you can leave. And I remember a couple of the women like, got up and left the class, and I was sitting there. And I remember someone asked me later, they were like, why didn't you leave? And I said, well, because like from a very early age, I was brown and a woman, and everybody was telling me to get out. And I was just like, I'm not leaving. I love this. I'm going to stay here. So I stayed in that class, but throughout my career, I would run up against different people who were sort of the gatekeepers. And when I started to realize how people get into these tenure track positions is they have a strong resume record, they know how to do research, and they know how to walk all over people. So how can we combat that? I can put these print projects together. I can invite younger artists. I can invite really strong artists that will show with the younger artists, and then I can travel them to these places that I'm being invited to, which then builds their record, which then they're able to compete out in the field with these other people, and they're not having to trample others to get to that place. So there's a real power in, in the print exchanges that I do, and, um, and it's funny because it's out in the print communities, people are like, oh yeah, she's always doing good things, but it's because I want to make change. It's my small little protest in the world of academia to make change is to do this. And if I'm, you know, earlier in, in my career, I was doing 15 to 20 of these a year because I was finding so many amazing young artists and I thought, gosh, we need to get their work in Dubai, we need to get it over into Ireland, into Germany, um, into Estonia, Finland, New Zealand, China, Japan, I know people in all those places, so I'm going to put their work there um, because I want to make change. And, I, and I, again, it's just an easy way if you're motivated to do it. Um, this is Karen Onias. I met her at that impact conference in Estonia. She was working at Zayed University in Dubai, and so then I created projects with her. 
And again, when, when you go to these conferences or openings, I always tell my students, like, reach out to different people, get to know them, get their business card, go home, send them an email, make a connection so that you can start you know, collaborating on this other level. And at the print conferences or any conference, there's these times when you get to meet like-minded people. This is one of the print exchanges and a panel I put together. Um, and these are all the printmakers who came to the panel. And again, these are printmakers from all across the United States and different parts of the country. So when I go to the conferences, I remember when I first was going, I thought, oh, I'm too shy. It's really hard for me to do this, and it costs a bunch of money to go to this. So then I thought, if I'm going to go to the conferences, then I'm going to create a project. I'm going to meet as many people as possible, and, I, and that's going to make all the money I invested into the conference to make it worthwhile. So when you guys start you know, going to the College Art Association or any of the conferences that you're doing, like just, it's going to cost a lot, but there are so many people you can meet, but it takes just going to the panels, talking with these people. Um, I require all my students to, to sit for the Q&A and ask questions. I always say to them, it's during that Q&A time that that person who's doing the panel or doing the presentation will be like, oh my god, that was a good question. Who is that? Let me invite that person to a project. <laughs> um, but the ones who run out, nobody remembers them. So I always tell my students, always, always stay for the Q&A. Ask some good questions. Ask how you can help the artist. That will make you stand out. And down the road, it will it will help you. And it's fun. OK, it's kind of dirty, the young panel. Uh, open portfolio at these printmaking conferences are when you can put your work out on the table, share it with a lot of people. I highly encourage this type of thing. Meeting people who run these companies that um, I've known the Takish family now for over, gosh, now it's 30 years. Um, and Phyllis McGibbon works at Wellesley University, and I've done projects there. But again, it's in this environment of the print conference that you meet some of these people and develop these friendships that last a long time. These are some of my students um, showing our visiting artist, Todd Christensen, from Highlands University, their work. Um, it's during these times when you are asked to share your work with, with visiting artists that is really important. Talking with amazing artists like Karen Kuntz. Um, and again, all while this crazy building was being built. <laughs> so, so a lot of times people see my work and they're like, oh, it's so playful and cute and you must just have so much fun. And I'm like, I'm freaking building a building and meeting with architects and finding for, <laughs> for this and that and looking at space and finding out that measurements are not right or wrong or they install the doors upside down. Like, it's crazy. Like as you think when you're a student, that's really hard. But when you get the job, then you get the the gift of building something, and then there's this whole other amount of, of work. And, uh, and it was funny, I included these pictures because I remember I was shooting through these with one of my grad students, and they said, we didn't know you did that. I'm like, are you what? I better start talking about it. <laughs> so these are our spaces while, while the building was being put together. So, And any of you are welcome to come to see Boulder. Um, I'll put my email and phone number out there, and you can come visit. Um, this is my office, because all those projects that I've done go into these flat files, which the university was going to throw out. Like when we were moving in the new building, they were like, we're just order new stuff. I was like, no, I'm just going to paint all the old stuff white and make it look nice. So this is our spray booth. Here's the studio at the panel, our beautiful little exposure unit. I thought I'd just include these because, like, for printmaking, you always wonder what spaces look like. These are King Family exhibition cases. So when um, Johnny sent his work out, we featured them in this space and uh, our work area. The case with the students. Um, this is now in uh, Bristol, uh, in the United Kingdom. There was another impact conference there, and I traveled there with my husband, husband to hang up another exhibit of prints. And all the time meeting different people. This was at one of the panels. You meet the most amazing artists at this conference. I can't like tell you how much you should be doing it. Uh, this is an artist residency with Karen Kuntz in uh, Nebraska. 
And a lot of these are just showing you like the, the work that I do. Uh, this is working with Catherine Siobhan at the DU, Denver University. I did a series of lithographs with her and her students. Here's how it came out. And a lot of it is referencing home. Uh, I'm sharing this in, image of uh, Sonia Keller Combs. She's an Alaska native. She was um, given an award of 50000 and they give these words to different <coughs> artists, and she was able to get them. But what was really impressive with me about Sonia is she does sculpture work, but she wanted to use the money to bring somebody in that would show her community printmaking. And so she used that money to fly me up to Fairbanks, Alaska to do a printmaking workshop at Fairbanks where she went to undergrad school. So I spent some time there doing some work. And so, uh, and I share it to say to people, like when you get these big opportunities at times, you can think about giving back to community like Sonia. I spent time um, working in Venice, um, I think this was in 2012, I did a residency on the island of Murano with a bunch of other printmakers, and we made work about the community area, and this was the print shop we were working in. I spent most of my time writing the vaporettos to all the islands around um, the area and speaking and talking with the people on the boats. And the pieces I made were um, documenting the different stops in Venice, um, and it was neat because uh, I took time to get to know the people in the community. So when we had our opening, a lot of local people came, and the other artists were like, "How do you know all these people?" And I said, "Well, I spent time getting to meet them all and seeing the places and learning the routes, and then I incorporated it into the work." Um, part of the print world is going to different places, like I did this morning, coming here to work with students in the foundations class. But this is working with. Michael Barnes at uh, Northern Illinois University. While I was there, we did a three-color lithograph. Um, I made two relief plates, five etchings, and about 50 monotypes. Uh, but I spent I spent a week there with them. Um, we just we had a crew of like 12 people working all the time. Um, but these are images of of that time together. And I think what's really powerful about printmaking is how we know each other's processes, and when we come together, we immediately just start like speaking. We know the same language, so we all help each other out. Um, and then while I was there, the prints that I, the monotypes I made, we then put a little exhibit together. And um, when you see me in the studio working, you, you just see that I'm pretty prolific, and I just am not inhibited, and I just like go and go. I think in the class this morning, um, I think I made. 15 or 20 prints, um, the first layer, and then I'm going to draw and paint back into them. Um, and I think as young artists at times, um, sometimes it's painful because we get so tied up when we're just starting out to make something perfect. But to really get good at something, I tell my students, like, you need to make tons of it. Like, you really need to just like keep making the work. And then this huge uh, story starts start to unfold and you become more comfortable with your mark making and with your storytelling as you just churn out the work and then you're able to pick from 50 pieces 20 pieces that you're going to apply to grad school with and then when they say to you in grad school like what's this work about you're able to say well it, i started with this and then i got here and then i'm here and then this is this body of work but if you don't make that many pieces your conversation is well i think i'm doing this but i might be doing that, but I'm not sure about this. And here are some ideas in my sketchbook. So when your teachers are like, make some work, make some work, it's like, go for it. So that you can have these conversations. And, and collaborative works are really important. This is working with uh, Miguel Rivera, Cara Day, and Patricia Aviello. Once we did a project in Kansas City where we all collaborated on works together. We shared our words that speak about who we are and where we're coming from. And while we were there, we went to visit different print shops, museums. And the power of printmaking is being able to go to many locations. Uh, I was invited to do a print at 
um, Crow Shadow, which is a professional print shop in Pendleton, Oregon. I was working with the master printer, and I drove all the way there, like over, I don't know, 12 hours or 13 hours to drive up there. And I took these large 30-inch round plates to print. And I remember meeting with the, with the master printer, and he was like, we could do one of these. And it was a graph plate. I was like, what? <laughs> so then I thought, oh, I drove up here with all this stuff. So I called Nicole Pietrantoni in Walla Walla, which was two hours away. And I said, of all these plates, and like this guy won't print them. And she said, just come up to my school. We'll help you. So I drove two hours north to Walla Walla and started working with Nicole to print the plates. And then her beginning students came in, and we gave them all the plates. And we printed all of them. Shebang. <laughs> so then I went back down to the master printer and he was like, when did you do that? I said, I drove two hours north. Blah, blah, blah. The students helped me print them. I got this whole project done. Um, so don't let yourself be held back. There are different times when we're in different situations and people will put up rules for you. But you can depend on your fellow artists. Call somebody, say, I want to do this, and they'll help you out if you're good, if you're good people. Yeah. And these are some of, this is a, a major solo exhibit that was at the University of uh, New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, um, I was invited by the curator to do this exhibit and they picked out 80 of my um, 2D works to frame and my sculpture pieces to work with and put this exhibit called Geographies of Memory together. Um, and it was really important to me because it was in Albuquerque, which is close to native lands and people. And, um, and I thought maybe a lot of native people will get to see this. And the people at the museum said, well, we have an opening, but we don't know how many people will come. And what was really incredible was that we had about 750 people come to the opening. And about 90% of them were native people. And it was incredible. And I said to people, like, why did you come? And they said, you know, there's this big school here in Albuquerque, and it's in our land, but we never see a native artist here. So we all wanted to see who this was and see who you are. And I was like, yay, this is great. And, and the cherry on top was that the Tamron Institute is across the street from this school. And they were having an opening the same night. And Partway through the opening, I saw all the people from Cameron come in. I was like, holy crap, that's Marjorie Devon, that's Rodney Hammond, that's like, well, Bill Latuka, what are you guys doing here? And they said, we had our opening, but nobody was there. <laughs> and they said, and then we heard from people that your event was happening across the street. He said, they said, we just closed up and came over here. And I was like, oh my god, that's awesome. So, you know, things can really happen in a way that you never expect. These are some of the bronze pieces I made. They're inspired by some of the ceramic pieces that I made. A lot of my earlier ceramic pieces were inspired by um, childhood bullies. So I made these ceramic dogs and gave them names that were ripping off of childhood bullies. Like Simon Joe thinks he's rich. Uh, Charlie the gay is looking for a rich girlfriend. I don't know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and, and then they, I don't know, they really took off. Um, and the, female piece there is like a self-portrait of me, the longer stories with it. But I'm really proud of this exhibit because it was at home and it told all these stories about my community and my community at home came and supported the exhibit. So when people say, oh my god, you had that show in Soho, was that really awesome? And I'm like, no, the one in Albuquerque was important because all my people were there. Um, Soho was nice, but I, I'd rather be with my people. So, so oftentimes when you're going through your art path, there are different things that we want to attain. A lot of times, the things that people say we want, when you really search inside yourself, it's some of the stuff that you grow up with that can really like make an impact for you. So just remember that. It really, you get to decide what's important to you. And driving that whole idea of like production, this is how I paint at home. I just work and work and work. Ceramic pieces. Like the guy with the little cage on top, his name is Manhor. <laughs> 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 I 
because I'm there now for it and then I'm going to about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, they all have this funny name. But it's all inspired by home, the land I come from. I think it's important to remember where you come from. And when I talk to people about colors, it's inspired by the Southwest landscape, the different times of day, um, breathing in that fresh air, looking at the petroglyphs of my community, um, and remembering that we're just a tiny part of this history of the land. I was thinking about that. These are all on the Navajo Reservation. I spent time in Nova Scotia working with Erica Walker at the Nova Scotia School of Art and Design. I had a, a residency there and was able to do some lithographs and um, some amazing projects uh, looking at the landscape and, and native history there, which was really incredible. Um, and then after that, I spent some time in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, kind of flew back to Denver, unpacked, threw the bags out, got a, had a whole other set of bags set to leave for um, Australia, and then went to Melbourne. And, and again, it was printmaking that took me to these places. I had met um, the director of the program, Rodney Forbes, through a print exchange. Um, one of his students was in a project, and then he contacted me afterwards and said, I'm the director of the school, and would you want to come to Melbourne? Uh, I saw that you invited my students in this project, and I said, sure, I'll go. So I ended up over there, and oh, I include this for printmakers and artists. It's my favorite thing to do when I travel is to go to art stores. Um, see these. And I'm such an idiot. I should have just put it on the credit card. We got that. <laughs> <laughs> or this. There's Rodney, my host. Um, yeah, I. That's one thing I could share is when you go travel, sometimes like use that credit card. If you see that beautiful thing, <laughs> get it. <laughs> I come back here and I'm looking on eBay and everywhere, and I can't freaking find that box of beautiful paints or that beautiful rare. Uh, I think it's made in the UK, but uh, now I'm like, I was, I think I was in Canada and uh, John Ford, the printmaker there, had three of them. And he was like, I don't even print anymore. Why don't you take them all? I'm like, oh, I couldn't take them. And now I'm like, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Should have taken them. So when you're offered beautiful gifts, your job is, thank you very much. This is so beautiful. <laughs> I'll throw my clothes out and put them in. <laughs> Please listen to that, because there's going to be times when you're offered things, and your generous nature will be, no, no, but Auntie Melanie is telling you, accept it, because <laughs> you'll regret it later. <laughs> um, yeah, so I accepted the trip to visit Australia and spent time there, um, and, and all these animals and things in these lands show up in my work. Wombat. Oh, they're beautiful landscape. And it's funny, people always say to me, like, where do you want to go when you're here in our country? I'm like, I'm going to go to our store and I'm going to go for a hike and I'm going to see like the land. And they're always like, well, we're in the land. I'm like, just take me somewhere. Let's go walk out there and just let me walk. And, and but it's really beautiful when you're able to do that. So there. These are working with the Aborigine artists in Australia, and, and it was interesting because I was meeting a lot of them, and they were like, we're from Melbourne, this is where first contact happened with our people, so a lot of us don't even look native, like we look white, and you know, so we want you to know that we are native, and, and I said, I, I know you are, it's okay, but they, they were very like uh, self-questioning about their identity, and so I said, you know, you know where you're coming from, your stories of the land and this, and they were like, yes, and I'm like, then you are. So, but we, we made a lot of work together. And then one of the uh, elders in the community came to me at the university and said, I have a child, my grandchild's in an immersion school, and all the kids at the school want to see a Native American, will you come and do a project with us? So I went to the school and did a project with the kids, because I think Stereotypes began at a young age, and so part of my journey and my research with my life is meeting with younger people and doing work with them to break the stereotypes. Because if they see me like this, then when they see the movies and pictures of Native people, then they're going to remember this and not that other thing. And so that, that's part of my work. 
Um, this is the shop there. Other artists and the work that came out of that. So you see the animals in the pieces. I might a little want that print later. <laughs> um, which draws us back to the, the work I do here um, with my gallery. I do, I do a lot of uh, sculpture work. So I started to design jewelry pieces and um, fabric pieces. And I remember somebody, I was at the opening once and somebody said, oh, Yelsey, are you selling out? And I said, no. I make all these art pieces that are really expensive, and I talk about the healing that the works do, but I have a lot of people who come to me who say, I'm going through cancer treatments, I want, I wish I could wear your print. I said, so I decided to make the scarves, and then I make the jewelry that hold, like, healing images for me so that when people buy the jewelry, they can wear it to some of these places that they're going through difficult times, or a mother is having a daughter who's going away to college and she wants to give her something for protection or just a reminder. So those those pieces are are out in the world for those reasons. Um, and I always feel bad when I tell people, well, someone's trying to shame me, and then I'm like, no, it's from this, and they're like, oh, God, I feel horrible. I'm like, you should talk to the artists before you judge them. There's always a reason for, for some artists for why, why they make the work that they do. Um, most recently, this fall, I was a visiting artist at the University of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I worked on a lithograph there, which is Bowie Lions, and I worked with Koichi uh, Yamamoto and um, Althea Murphy. Um, we did a lithograph, a relief print. Um, that last person, this is Gino, he's from um, Cuba. And we met and we were able to speak Spanish together and then I invited him to come to Colorado this summer. So he printed an edition of 30 of my line of pet that we made and he was staying there until all hours and he was like, I'm going to print this for you and you're going to prove it. I was like, holy crap, you're coming to Colorado. <laughs> so always help the artists because there could be different things that, that make you stand out. Uh, this was one of my undergrads, Haley uh, Takahashi, who's actually from Fort Collins. Um, she went to CU for undergrad, and then she's now at the University of Tennessee for grad school with my friend Zoe. Um, all the work we were making. But it was a week long, and anytime I go to these places, I just like work, work, work like a little human. Uh, this was an artist residency at uh, Colorado College. Um, I was given a huge studio space to make work for six weeks, and these are all the pieces that came out of six weeks. Did all those prints, all these paintings. Uh, then it came into an exhibition there. And it all originates like at home with my little dog Tidbit. Uh, uh, this is my home studio space, kind of like a press. Um, these are some of the paintings that I've been working on recently. First layers, like they just look like a little demon to just layer, layer. So there's a relief print, then screen printing, and then drawing back into it, painting to build up all the layers. These are the, some of the most recent pieces I've been working on most recently. Images of women, self-portraits uh, of me, Peter Strong. And, oh, I was talking to Vince about these little houses. Um, I have this series that I've been working on about these little houses during COVID. Um, they're inspired by giants by my uh, my mother and my grandmother. And I think, I think, yeah, I'm up to, I think I'm up to 1,800 right now. So I stack them in these things and like number them and just put them together and they'll be shown in a big grid. And right now the more print event is happening in the Denver area. So the one of the first exhibits was here in Fort Collins. The opening is here, and I have to do a shout out to Johnny for taking my piece. Uh, yeah, there was going to be a snowstorm or something one day, and I, I couldn't come up on a Tuesday, and they were closed on Monday. So I asked your wonderful uh, colleague, Professor, if you could take my work over, and he did. And so this was the opening event of that. 
exhibit. I think it's still up, so if anybody wants to go and see it. This was another exhibit in at Edgewater uh, Library in Lakewood. Um, and then more images of me in the studio with my students. And we were talking about the blundstone boots. I have my red ones on, and then in that picture you can see the striped ones. <laughs> but both, both Johnny and I have these awesome boots from uh, Tasmania. Um, and always thinking about home, thinking about what's important are these little moments. So when you get overwhelmed, I always tell my students, go take a walk, breathe, don't get caught up in all this other stuff. It's in these little moments of time where we get centered. And I, I travel back to the Navajo Reservation to get centered um, and pay homage up to um, and it all started when I was a little kid. That's what's important. Thank you. And I always tell people, like, I, I would love for you to ask me questions, but because I'm a teacher and sort of bossy now, I'm not scared to ask. I can ask you questions, so it's better if you guys ask me, because then when I'm like, who are you? What's your name? Tell me something. It, it's way easier if you ask questions. When, um, is there like a point in time when you're doing your prints, you do so many layers, how do you feel like when a piece is done? Because sometimes I feel like it's really hard for me to gauge that and so I know when I've gone too far. When you make as much as, like when you get into that place of just making, it's sort of like, like cooking. It's the, the best way to say it. It's like when people are cooking and they have the right ingredients, you just sort of taste it and know. Like with the artwork, I obviously can't taste it, but you're tasting it through your eyes and here, and when you're making so much, you just feel like it's done. And I remember when I was in undergrad school, these artists would talk about like, you have a conversation with the work, and the colors will tell you, I thought, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but then at a certain point in your life, it's gonna happen where it's gonna start telling you stuff or talking, like you're gonna have so many, and then this one's gonna say, I'm done. And then you're going to be like, that one's done, and you put it down. And the thing is, I think one of the wonderful ways to describe it also, one of my artist mentors said to me, um, pieces aren't really done. They can be in a comfortable resting place. And I love that, because sometimes when something was done, later I'd look at it and be like, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> then I'd be like, well, if I just like gessoed over that and then painted back into it, like it could, so you can shift it around. And I think owning that power to move your work in that way is important. But it, but it's hard. The further you go in your work, and the more well known your work gets. So be people who are like, don't take it further. Like you have to save it for this, for like this history or whatever. But there is a weird place in there that you have to still stay in this creative place and not let it get too precious. But I have to hear my own advice because I'm obsessed with printing and making stacks and then wrapping them and writing the number and then putting it in a bag. And then like when I'm invited to an exchange, I'll make like 10 pieces and they're all editions of 25 and I'm in love with all of them. And then I put them in a little box and I tie it and then I'm like, Oh, I can't send that one. I'm going to start in that one, so then I'll make another one. <laughs> but then, if you're in this mode of making a lot, and it's good, and people want it, then you can never say no to an exhibition um, invitation. Because that's another problem with young artists, is that we spend so much time working on a couple of pieces, and then when someone says, we'd like to do an exhibit of your work, and you don't have enough work, and you don't know how to make a bunch of work, then you're in the place of like, ooh, I will show those five fantastic pieces, and then people will come to the opening, and then someone else will say, wow, these are great. I'd love to show them next month in my, at this place. And as a young artist, you're like, ooh, I don't have that many. Maybe I'll contact you in a year. I will tell you now, when you go and contact them in a year or six months, they've moved on. And it sucks, because <laughs> you're like, I'm ready. I have my masterpiece, and they're like, I'm there. Who are you? And you're like, I'm that person. You said you wanted more of these. 
I like them as well. Now I don't. So, so I'm telling you, learn to make a lot of work and be ready to let go and put it out there in the world. And then be ready to make more. That's a long answer to that. <laughs> that's a lovely long answer. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Great. All right, another one. Yes. As uh, an artist, I feel like sometimes I feel like I experience imposter syndrome when I'm working in different mediums than the one I'm studying. Yeah. And looking across your body of work, you obviously work in a lot of different mediums. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you find yourself um, throughout each different kind of work that you do. That happens to everybody. When we start out and we're young, we think you have to do it. Like, you have to take a painting class, you have to learn the proper way. The proper way is just doing it, making it, making it, learning from the process. Um, I remember this amazing painter, Harmony Hammond. My husband had her as a professor, and she's amazing. And Harmony's saying was, someone said to her, how do you learn to paint? She said, you learn to paint by painting. You just do it. And she would have her students make these gigantic canvases and little canvases, and she'd just be like, paint. And I remember my husband was saying to me, he said, it was so great. We made all these things, and we could do all this stuff. Then there were students in the class who were angry because they wanted to learn how to paint a tree and like how to do things just so. And, and part of me like, so go learn how to do that. But when you're an artist, in the true form, I believe, you're just making it. And part of the hardest thing, I think, to learn is to give our permission ourselves permission to do that. We're always going to feel like this imposter with certain things, but that's why your teachers are always like, just try it, just do it, make a mistake. And you'll learn from that mistake, and then you just do it again and do it again. If you're a ceramic person, you throw 50 pots, tea bowls, and you really know how to do it, and then you discover Peter Volkos and see him punching them, and you're like, what? He threw a big pot, and then he punched it. <laughs> why? Um, so there's, always, there's all these levels of art making, your job is to discover them. Uh, okay, that one question there, and then here, and then we'll come back over here. Okay. What initially drew you to print making? The paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, was in, I was in high school, and I went to a Quaker boarding school on the East Coast outside of Philadelphia. My sophomore year there, uh, my roommate, her name is Hayes Sprunt, she had these etchings, and they, they were of shells, and they were like that big. And I saw them in our dorm room, and I, I said, what's that? And she said, oh, they're etchings. And I said, what's that? And she said, prints. And I was like, then she handed it to me, and I felt the paper. And it was soft, and then I smelled the ink, and I just like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and she drew, like, really realistic. So my sophomore, Junior year, I didn't take any art classes because I just thought I could never make art like Hayes Sprunt. And then my senior year, I got all the requirements out of the way and I was able to take an art class. And I went to the art class and the art teacher said, where have you been? Like, why haven't you taken art? And I said, well, I saw Hayes's work the first year I was here and I just would come and sit with her in the studio and watch her do her stuff and I would watch her play the violin and I just couldn't do any of that. And she said, Yazi, like, Everyone has a different way of making art, and you should never compare yourself to anybody else. And she said, you obviously love art making in the studio. I was like, yes, I, this, is, this is for me. And she said, so you will be doing this for as long as you want. And, and so that's how I stumbled into printmaking was the paper. I just, like, even to this day, I'll meet paper makers, and they'll give, there's a piece of paper someone gave me. It's this Asian paper, and they were like, want to give this to you to draw on. It's so beautiful. I've never drawn on it. <laughs> because it's so beautiful. I just touch it and look at it and put it back in the drawer. Like, okay, maybe. But there's a seductive, beautiful side of paper making and paper with printmaking that is just like, I, I don't know. So it was, it was the paper and the smell of the ink. And now I work with the kua, which is soy based, so there's not a smell, but it, it also has a smell. But there's all these different things. So, but it was the paper because when I first touched it, oh, and I was at um, your studio earlier, and that paper, the white, three sixty, what right? 
I was like, oh, what is this? Tell me. And yeah, so that's what drew me to printmaking. Uh, um, so I'm not exactly sure what works with yeah, questions, but um, I feel like in the earliest works that you're showing with the wrapping paper and the uh, like flower bags, there's mm -hmm. sort of this like temporary quality to them as materials. And I was curious if that sort of like, I don't know, temporary quality, I guess, showed up in any of your present work and what kind of drove it like then? It does. Like I often will work on things that are discarded and I'll gesso them and then work back into them. I'm not too concerned about the archival quality. I think when I spent the summer workshop at the Tamron, it was funny, we met with the registrar um, and we were looking at all these amazing prints that are worth like thousands of dollars and we said to her like, is the archival quality of the paper or process really important and could you tell us about that? And she said, let me tell you, when you're not famous and you're learning, it doesn't matter. Just make it however you want. When you become Picasso and really famous, there's people like me who will take care of it. <laughs> and she said, so I don't think you should worry about that. You should worry about making good art. Any way you can make it, just make it. And I was like, why didn't I meet that person in undergrad school? <laughs> um, but yeah, so that philosophy of like just finding the materials and working with it. And then when you go to Paris and you go to the Museum d'Orsay and you look at Gauguin's paintings and all the, they're all like on cardboard. They're on these scraps of burlap that they sewed together and I remember you can't see any of that in art history and then I went over there in Paris and I'm like these are all cardboard <laughs> and the light is really dim and the curator there was like yeah they're, the, we find the drawings on the cardboard really powerful but we have to keep them in dim light to keep them safe and they're all in the temperature and I just thought and then there were sheets of burlap burlap sewn together with canvas and I remember I took all these pictures just to, like I was enthralled with the overall image of seeing this actual image of a famous thing but what impressed me the most was that all these stitching of all these random materials to make these beautiful pieces and I just thought holy crap like it's true it's if you can work on anything so let yourself go there so that yeah that's a good question yeah, um, I thought the printed changes that you showed in the beginning were very impactful, and um, you're trying to represent those people that were being represented yeah. from other countries. How did you start that? Or, um, yeah. um, I started it by just meeting nice printmakers. And, and it's funny because I remember at one point somebody um, criticized me uh, and said, you just accept anybody. Like, y'all be able to take anyone. I said, yeah, I do. And they were like, like you should have some category to like choose your people. And I said, I do, I choose nice people. <laughs> I choose nice people who want to help each other out. So if I have an amazing artist like Jean Quick Smith, who's like blue chip artist in New, in New York, like selling these paintings for fifty thousand, and she wants to show with young native artists who are unknown because she wants to elevate because if a museum wants to put the portfolio in their collection, if there's a Jean Quick to see, a Neil Ambrose Smith, a Bobe Lyons, a Catherine Polk, like holy crap, they're like, yes, we want the project. But then guess what? There's about five other unknowns who go into that collection and then it builds their reputation. And those artists that I work with know that's how I work. And they also understand, like sometimes I'll do a talk like this. And then uh, a prominent artist will hear about it and they're like, you know, I want to be in the next one you're doing. And then I'll meet a young student who has a great question. I'm like, hey, are you a printmaker? And then, and then you just do that. When I do my printing changes also, I'm like crazy about my deadlines. I never give extensions. The deadline is the deadline. And if people can't make, make it, even if you're a Lynn Allen who's like super top echelon artist, or um, who else has been like, I was like, is this still recording? <laughs> <laughs> There's certain people who are like really like their prints two weeks after the, the project is, did, is done. And they like that. So whenever I put these things together, I literally send the call out and it's filled within hours or a day. 
and then people contact me and are like, can I get in? I'm like, it built two hours ago. They were like, you just sent it out. I'm like, I know. <laughs> people know that I get it done and that it's going to go somewhere important. So, so after a while, I say to, when I talk to young artists who are putting them together, I'm like, keep your deadlines and respect the work and respect everybody equally in the project. Nobody should be more important than the other. And then make sure that it gets into collections and that you have the exhibits and you report back to everybody. And then people want to be in it. Then you're never begging people. Uh, and whenever they fill up, if people want to be in it, I always say, I'm going to do another one in a, in a month or two. So don't worry. And I always know people who are putting them together, too. So if people are like, I want to be in one, and I'm not doing one, I'll send your name to somebody else. And you can do them. Each of you guys can do them. It's really, it's really not that hard. The only hard part about it is, is when somebody comes to you and says, can I please have an extension? And you're like, oh, I don't know. And then you feel horrible. Then you give them an extension. And then all of a sudden, you're hurting cats. And then it feels horrible. That's the hard part. So you have to be really tough <laughs> and say, no extensions. You meet the death. You didn't pay the fee, you're out. And guess what? The fee for a lot of my projects is like super low. It's like $45. And it's so funny when people contact me and are like, I don't want to pay the fee. I'm like, what? Like, you're getting a John Quick to see Smith. You're getting a Catherine Polk. You're getting a Bobe Lyons. Like, are you like kidding? Do you know how much these little works are? And you're, you're not just going to get one. You're going to get five of them. <laughs> and then the person's like, oh, I'm still not sure if I want to pay $45. I don't have to make the print and buy the paper. I'm like, uh, you don't deserve to be in this. <laughs> so again, when you're doing exchanges, there's some nice things about it. And then anybody who wants to put one together, if you need advice, you can email me or call me. I give out my number freely. Um, but it's, it's all about just returning good in the community. At least that's how I do it. Is some some people have their uh, regulations that are different than mine. Other questions? Yes. I was just wondering when you mentioned your painting process, you talked about when your like painting comes out, and I was just curious. Um, is there any plan behind that at all before you make like a cohesive series, or do you just kind of go solely based on what comes out? When when I first started painting, I tried to invent all these reasons for why I was doing it. But now I'm at that old lady level where everything and every medium I can do is I can tell the story in different forms. And so it just flows out of me. But I'm also a great believer in just letting it come out. And then when I have all those pieces, I can edit out which ones I want and which ones I'm not going to put out there. Um, but it's for me, it's, it's making a bunch and then finding a story within that. Um, but when you're school, I think at times there's an assignment and there's something given, and so then you have to sort of think about that. But I'm at the point in my life that any assignment that I'm given, I can gear it towards my message. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when you're starting out as young artists, you're always trying to satisfy the teacher or trying to get that A and not really thinking about how your story can come across in any assignment that's given. And then how? And then when you start to do that, you start building a body of work that you're able to talk about, as opposed to like getting out of undergrad school and then saying, "How do I build a body of work for grad school?" If you've been telling your story and all the assignments and, and pulling it out, you can you'll have a body of work you can talk about. But if you're in the state of mind of like, "Oh, the teacher wants us to research something in the news. Uh, let me choose uh, the war and let me just make something about that." If it doesn't connect back to you, then, then when people look at it, it's all separated. Mm -hmm. so, so at times, I think you have to think about what's, what's, your, what's driving you, what's the main thing you want to get across with the work, and then just make the work about that, and do the research. When you do the research for, and the research could be a hike. The research could be interviewing your grandmother. The research could be trying all the coffee or tea in, Fort Collins if it's food and coffee you're interested in. And then in trying that, you start to do the sketches from all those places you've been to. You start looking at the colors. You start getting to know the people who are the baristas. And then there is the content for the work. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's now 3.30, so maybe oh, this okay. last question, okay, last and then uh, we want to be respectful of the yeah. time. So. Um, 
you mentioned that you like traveled to all these different countries and all these different places in the United States. Like, did you find that in these different printmaking shops that there were a lot of similarities in the way that people worked, or was it, you know, was there like distinctive features? There, there are distinctive things at each of the places, but because we have a common uh, kind of process and way of, of working in studios, there's different things that immediately we, we have common ties. But some places make all their own ink, some places process things in different ways. Every place is different, but I, I think if you're confident with your own way, uh, and you, and this is what I always tell my students, is, is like, I'm gonna show you how to do a relief print in my way. As you discover each of these processes, you'll find your own way of doing it. And again, part of coming to terms with blocking this artist path is, is doing your process or your thing enough that you become confident in that, that that's where your power is at. Too often, I think, as artists, we, we don't acknowledge that practice that we have. If you're not doing it enough, then that's when you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. Or, but if you're constantly doing it, you're like, holy crap, I can like tear that paper, I can do this, this is how I do it. And you own it, and you're excited about it, and you're not timid. But if you're not in the studio, you're not working, you're sitting around in a movie theater or somewhere else out of the studio and not doing it, then you're not gonna know. But if you're in that crazy place of making art, when you go to Japan or Russia or anywhere else, you'll walk in that studio, you'll know how to do your process and there's this confidence and people can see it. Artists can see when somebody's really in the studio. And when you're not, oh my gosh. It's amazing because as teachers, we see it like we're like they're in the studio, they're in the studio. <laughs> that was not. <laughs> and the students are always trying to give us like DS lines of like why they're not working or and I'm just like, oh my god, the amount of time you're spending in making up the story of not doing the work. Like you could just make the work. <laughs> you could like throw it on the ground and pee on it and run all over it and it would be stronger than the story you're telling me. <laughs> and they're always like, really? I'm like, yes, like Stop with the excuses, just make something, make something bad, make something. And then let's see how we can make it stronger. Because once you make that ugly thing, then you're like, oh God, that's ugly. But then you're like, oh my God, I love the ugly. And like, I'm gonna make 10 more of the ugly. And then you just, then you start having this conversation and then somebody else who's doing the same thing comes in and they're like, oh my God, I like that ugly. <laughs> and yeah, I was gonna throw those all out, but now I really love that. But then you don't get there unless you go there. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah.